I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with author and financial advisor Edward Goodfellow about his amazing book. It is called Seven Steps to a Better Portfolio. In it, he examines evidence-based information and how it can help investors capture returns and manage risks to improve their odds of an investment outcome. Seven Steps is an investment decision-making framework to help investors be more accountable, build emotional resilience, encourage forward thinking, and instill confidence as they journey into the uncertain world of investing. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his remarkable book. The links are below this interview. Edward, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Logan, I'm very happy to be here. Let's start out with a basic, straightforward question. What was your inspiration to write this book? Uh, Logan, it's odds. Mm -hmm. I think we all are trying to improve the odds of an outcome. So when I wrote this book, I said, well, we need a book to help investors with three things. Focus on the variables they control. Two, use academic research and evidence-based research to improve their decision-making. And three, better manage or navigate the noise to better manage the emotions and discipline. If you do those three things, you, you start to improve the odds of an outcome. You know, I wrote seven steps basically as a guide to help investors use evidence-based information to better understand risk and return to improve that thing, which is the odds of an outcome. Tell us a little bit about your background and how it helped you in writing this book. Well, Logan, it's I'm very fortunate to be where I am. I'm very fortunate to have the experience and the education and knowledge I have. I've spent over 30 years working with retail clients. As you can imagine, they're a very emotional group of people. They have fears, they have hopes, they have frustrations, they have concerns. The ultimate goal is how do they improve their decision making? So I learned a lot from all the questions from them. Plus, I've also been lucky for 20 years of teaching. Teaching undergraduate, graduate, CPA students uh, how do markets work? How to value assets? Where are risks? Where are returns? And also, I'm very lucky throughout my years of travels. I've got a great solid education. I've got a chartered financial analyst designation, chartered accountant designation up here in Canada, CPA designation, certified financial planner designation. And I'm also very fortunate to to have worked with Dimensional Fund Advisors, a global investment management firm that has very deep connections to the academic community. You know, I was able to take all this experience, this education, this practical knowledge, and put it into the book, Seven Steps. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, your background is very extensive when it comes to experience and uh, credentials. So obviously you've got the know-how to write a book like this. Uh, in chapter one, you mentioned four investment questions that every investor should ask. Could you elaborate a little bit? Absolutely. These are my favorite questions for my clients and my students. So the questions are, why are you investing? Where do returns come from? What is risk and how do you capture returns? So let me explain. Why are we why are we investing? So again, I think people have lots of ideas and they say, well, the primary answer is to get a return. I want to win. I don't want a loss. So you're seeking a return. It's that simple and it's that complicated. The second question is, and this is my favorite question, finance students is, where do returns come from? Again, people have lots of answers. They think it comes from CNBC or their broker or something. No. The answer, Logan, is returns come from risk. Return is compensation or accepting risk. And the third question is, well, what is risk? Risk in the context of investing is the degree of uncertainty of an outcome. It's also the risk of expected and unexpected. See, risk is fundamental to all investing decisions and is often misunderstood. But the reason I wrote the book was, I said, well, wait a minute, why don't we say, how do we capture return and manage risk to improve the odds? That is the story behind seven steps. Wonderful. Now, those are four common sense questions, but isn't investing in the investment world a lot more complicated than that? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> well, we're complicated. Right. Um, you know, markets, interest rates, pandemics, inflation, geopolitics, company earnings, and I'll mention the name Donald Trump and so on and so on. They, they're, they're, they create a lot of uncertainty, a lot of 
confusion, right? There's never ending news uh, that can affect our emotions, our views of investing, and of course, the value of our investment. There's endless opinions and ideas telling you, Logan, this is what you should do. This is what you should do next. There's endless investment choices and temptation. Something is always happening. We're not sure what it is, what it means, or what we should do with it, do about it. What is the deal with investing? Sometimes you can't put your finger on it. So how do you counter this endless investing noise? Well, you got to reframe the question to, from what's the deal with investing to, what's my strategy to accomplish my objective? Can you give me an example about what you mean about strategy? Well, I'll take strategy and I'll change it from investing to something else. So here, here's me. I'm, look at me. I want to live to 90 plus years of age. I want to wake up on my 90th birthday and have a cup of coffee and I want to be healthy, right? So am I going to live to 90? I don't know. But what can I do today to improve the odds that I can live to 90? Hmm. So this is where I take the same concepts of the book and say, okay, I want, to, I want to live a long, healthy life. How am I going to do that? I want to be a successful investor. How do I do that? Well, first of all, I'm going to focus on what I control. I'm going to use the proper evidence-based research to base my decisions on what I can do. I'm going to better manage and navigate the noise to better manage my emotional decision-making. So it's simple from what I control is I'll eat more salads and less burgers. I'll get daily exercise. I will consume less sugar. I will eat less salt. I will absorb less stress from the environment, including the media and the social media. I will improve my social circle as documented in the blue zone. Mm -hmm. So these are things I control. The second thing, evidence-based information, whether it's in finance or health, use the best information to know what to include in exercise, what to include in diet. And third, manage the noise, manage your stress. Stress is the silent killer and also is a silent killer in investing. You've got to have the right process and structure and the right, you've got to turn it in the right stuff and tune out the wrong stuff to improve that odds. My goal or my strategy is to, to accomplish this, is make better decisions with better information to better manage myself with better habits, to improve the odds that I can live to 90 years of age. It's a complicated world, of course, and people don't always make the best decisions. How can people make better, more informed decisions? Logan, this is a great question because this is my one of my favorite stories to the students. So I ask my students or my clients, I say to my students, how do you figure something out? So the first thing you do is say, well, I'm going to ask someone for an opinion. So you go out and you get an opinion. Now, an opinion is just a view or a judgment about something, not necessarily a fact or knowledge. It's just an opinion. So you get an opinion about investing or the market. You dig a little deeper. So you go from opinion to information. Information is something now you read, you saw, you heard. Uh, you got it from the media, the social media, from your friends. And let's just say a piece of information is the market fell 6% last month, just as a hypothetical. So... So you had an opinion about investing, you got a piece of information. Third level is knowledge. Knowledge is information coupled with understanding, experience, and expertise. So now you study the market and say, oh, well, the market fell 6% or more 22 times in 30 years. So you've got this knowledge now of what happened with COVID and 9-11 and uh, the credit crisis in 2008. You get a better understanding of that. So you've gone from opinion to information to knowledge. Now let's say you go to wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied with judgment earned through direct experience over time. Wisdom tells us more about ourselves and how do we react to information, in this case, react to markets. Um, it gives us, as you know, as you get older, you get wiser. I, would, I will do this better. I won't make this mistake twice. Uh, it comes with age, uh, hopefully. And it helps you, in this case, wisdom will help you understand risk better and why you want to allocate and diversify. But this is my favorite. So you're trying to make a decision. You go from opinion, information, knowledge, wisdom. And this is where finance comes in, academia. Academia was born in finance, was born out of the 50s because of technology and, and, and the computing power. So academics take, take all this information, opinions, and knowledge and test it and test it and test it. And uh, they try to figure out the how and the why. So they do a rigorous, independent, peer-reviewed, time-tested research into markets. It is incredibly invaluable, incredibly valuable. It tells us how markets work, where are risks, where are returns, how to capture returns, how to manage risks. Now, is academic research commonly used in investment management? No. No. <laughs> that's, that's a great question. So here, think about this. 
in in uh, the investment world lacks academic rigor. Uh, lawyers coming for the bar are required to know the, the law. They don't just make stuff up. Physicians must follow or adhere to the best medical practices. Uh, engineers, when they're building a bridge, they don't they don't improvise. Hmm. But the problem in finance is they rarely adhere to academic knowledge. And this is just one of the phenomenons of our emotions, right? So the idea behind seven steps was to take, I don't think they're complicated, but relatively complicated academic finance stuff from the textbooks along my wall here and summarize it in a simple book, right? Hmm. So if we can understand risk and return and to understand risk and return, it's not a good idea to learn it from opinions and information, but to learn it from academic research. So academic research and wisdom is like a library of knowledge, whereas opinions and random information are like getting your advice from the National Enquirer. So there's quite a difference. You don't want to get your advice from the National Enquirer, that's for sure. So well, maybe this is a good to... time. <laughs> maybe this is a good time for you to explain to our listeners and viewers the seven steps. Okay. So the key to the seven steps is to think your portfolio is 100. So whether it's a million, 10 million, 100 million, it's still 100. The question is, what do you, where do you put it? So the first question, the first step is allocate across the world. Now, I recognize you are in the U.S., uh, but up here in Canada, we, we, we need to be more diversified. So we think of it as allocation across the world, across the global capital markets. Why do we do this? Well, again, academic research tells us this reduces risk, enhances return. So step one is allocate. Step two is diversify. Uh, diversify meaning there's 11 sectors in every market. You want to diversify across those 11 sectors. And you also want to use index funds or asset class funds to diversify rather than picking individual stocks. Why? Again, academic research tells us that it improves return and reduces risk. The third variable is to focus on dimensions of higher returns. This might be the more complicated part of the book. I have three appendices that explain it. It's just basically saying that value stocks and small cap stocks and profitable, highly profitable stocks have higher expected returns. Uh, again, this is identified by academic research and can be utilized in a portfolio to actually enhance return and, again, reduce risk. So that's steps one, two, and three. Step four is academic research. This just encourages people to say, what does modern portfolio finance say or modern portfolio theory say about how we should manage money rather than the fellow on TV or the guy on the bus or the newspaper? Mm -hmm. What should I actually do? So step four is just to Take a moment and say, okay, what would a large institutional pension do with academic research? Maybe I should apply that. Now, five is manage strategy risk. Strategy risk is about managing yourself. It's about managing yourself under pressure, right? It's synonymous with, say, a poorly run company. It's the things we make mistakes on. So you see a good company, a bad company, a really good company has a very good process and structure and stays the course. So strategy risk is number five is manage yourself better. Number six is manage investment choice risk. There's a lot of temptation out there. The problem is you need to understand odds. If you buy this investment, are the odds lower? Are the odds, you gotta understand the odds of these investments. So it's called, I call it the low probability test, right? You need to understand risk and you gotta manage your overconfidence uh, and you understand the, prob the probability and better manage the information. So number six is, manage investment choice risk. And number seven is manage costs and taxes. Uh, on the journey of growing wealth, you want to minimize your taxes over time by minimizing your transactions and your realizing of capital gains. And of course, it's always good to minimize your costs. Wonderful you know, advice. Like sure, that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Um, you know, the key to the seven steps is I'm trying to tilt the odds in the investor's favor because odds are everything and managing the variables to control to improve those odds is everything else. Exactly. If the odds are in your favor, you're reducing that risk and emphasizing reward. And it's what every investor wants, particularly those who are on a shorter time frame when it comes to retirement. The name of the book is called Seven Steps to a Better Portfolio. The book provides a practical investment decision-making framework to help investors improve their odds of a successful long-term investment outcome. Edward, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. 
Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.